opportunity to share with each other, to share your word, and to hear from your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to us, that through all that goes on today, we will see you and go away lifted up because you work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I welcome everybody to stand. And we're going to uh, sing an upbeat song. We have no drums, so I expect you guys to be helping me along, okay? We are drums. <laughs> so I think everybody knows this song. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was mine too, till I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. My failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into You've called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Your freedom is all that I know. The old man knew, Jesus, when I met you, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. chains break at the weight of your glory i needed shelter i was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when i was broken you are my healing now your love is the air that i'm breathing i have a future my eyes are open because when you call my name You may be seated. I don't know what's next. Randy? Uh, the welcome. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> We're all discombobulated this morning. Sorry.
since Randy did the welcome prayer before the song, I'll jump in now. Um, <laughs> all right, my name is Matt, if you don't know me. A um, couple, a couple announcements today. First one is the Connect card, which is this thing sitting in the seat in front of you. Uh, it has a bunch of information you can fill out. Uh, your information, if you want to connect with somebody at the church, whether you have an address update, if you're in the directory, or if you want to talk to somebody about something, this is a way to get in touch with us. Secondly, uh, we have church camp coming up. So today is the last Sunday that you can sign up for church camp. It's $75. Uh, if you have sand blast, will be happening at the same time, which is an event for the youth at the same location. Also, currently, the lake level is too low for boats, just as an FYI, in case you were planning on bringing your boat. Um, Third, we have Outdoor Movie Night coming up. It'll be on August 26th, free dinner starting at 7, movie starting at 7.45. The movie is How to Train Your Dragon. If you haven't seen it, it's hilarious, it's great. Um, and volunteer help will be needed, so if you are free that evening and you want to, um, please come by We or let Leah know and go to the office, and we can get, you can get you set up with volunteering for that event. And then lastly, there's a women's event. Um, called Venture. It's on September 23rd from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. in Puyallup, um, run by the Northwest uh, Women's District, who was headed by Joy Newburn, our very, our very own Joy Newburn. That's uh, $20, uh, and there will be card pulling available as well. So you can sign up for that online, uh, or connect us, or you know, again, contact the office. So with that, I'll invite up Alessandra. Good morning. I'm going to pray over our offering this morning, um, and before I do so, I'm going to share a scripture from 2 Corinthians 8, 8 through 9. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. The ways to give should be behind me. Um, you can give uh, through the app or in the giving station in the back or um, online um, through the church's website. So I'm going to go ahead and pray over our offering. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for being able to gather today and worship you, Lord. And um, we just thank you for the wonderful privilege to continue our worship through our giving, Lord. Um, we just thank you so much, Jesus, for your sacrifice that we can be rich through you, Lord, in your love and your grace and your mercy, Father. So I just pray that um, you would lead us to give in the way that you would have us give, Lord. And I just pray over the offering this morning um, and a blessing over the giver. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Push the wrong button here. Okay. Uh, I'm doing it this morning. Okay. Uh, first of all, we you may remember that we took up an offering to help buy a or two refrigerators for Ecuador and uh, for Inca Link and their ministry at the Bonsai Ministry. So we have a short video back from the church in Puerto Viejo. Uh, the pastor is going to say thank you. So let's run those by. You can watch and see a picture of the refrigerator you helped buy, and um, the stuff they started stuffing. Lost myself again. Okay. I think we lost our sound. Hola, muchas gracias a la iglesia de Harbor Heights. Gracias por la donación de la refrigeradora. Estamos muy contentos y lo vamos a usar para el ministerio. Gracias. Gracias. Okay, those are the bonsai kids from Puerto Viejo, Ecuador. Uh, we also are going to have another short video here in a moment. Um, 
about common services. We've talked a little bit about common services. And on the 12th of August, we're going to have some missionaries here from common services. So don't miss out on that. And uh, so we're going to see just a short clip about common services and what they do and where they work. Our world is urgently seeking answers to poverty, injustice, and disasters. The fact is, our world is broken. So what can we do? We can be a part of taking the gospel to the world's poor and to communities devastated by disaster. We can provide clean water, food, and restore homes. We can help teach better farming methods, create small business opportunities, and we can give access to quality education. We can partner with local alliance churches worldwide to respond to disasters. We can support the dreams of local leaders who want to help their vulnerable communities. And we can develop men and women with a passion for Jesus, who in turn show and tell the gospel to their own neighborhood. Because it's only the gospel that can transform and restore. And at the heart of the gospel is our God's compassion. This is what Kama Services is about. Towards the end of the Vietnam War, Compassion compelled the Christian and Missionary Alliance to begin a holistic ministry called Kama Services. It was created to meet the overwhelming needs of refugees. Today, Kama continues to respond to the needs of people affected by wars, poverty, or disasters, keeping the gospel at the center. Because of your generosity and because of the people you stand to serve, marginalized women have found dignity through education and safe work. Small businesses and microeconomics have lifted families out of poverty. Displaced families and overlooked communities have access to the gospel now for the first time. Will you join in? Together, we can bring God's compassion, the heart of the gospel, to even more communities. As compassion moved Jesus, may his compassion for this broken world move us. Okay, Common Services is a relief and development arm of the Christian Missionary Alliance. We move in in emergencies. We move in on special occasions. We help refugees around the world. So you've seen several things here. Uh, you don't often hear a lot about Common Services because we bring in missionaries who are doing other kinds of ministries. And so we want to make sure that you share and know a little bit more about the Common Services, especially since we're going to be having a missionary coming from there in a couple of weeks. So thank you very much. All right, let's stand again. And I just, I'm struggling a little this morning and <clears throat> I've had a couple of really bad weeks at work and you know, I've had to repent a lot. And what really amazes me about our God is that he uses us broken vessels, you know, and all he wants is a willing heart. And he never changes. He's always there picking us up. He's always good. He's always faithful, you know. He never stops loving us. So I want to pray, and then uh, we'll sing some songs. But um, let's, let's pray. Father, how I thank you for who you are, your faithfulness, your kindness, your goodness how you love us, Lord, how you give us so much grace and mercy. Father, this morning, I pray that we could lay everything at your feet and just focus on you, Jesus, and worship you because you deserve all of our worship and praise, honor and glory. We love you, Father, in your name. Amen.
until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so have led me through the fire and in darkest night you were close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God and all my running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life I lay down I surrender now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down i surrender now i give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of Jesus, I 
look around and see who all is here. And we're going to pray for these kids as they go downstairs and have their Advent children's adventures today. Let's everybody pray for the kids. Father, we just pray for each of these children that are here today, that your word would enter their hearts, it would be living, and it would show up in the way that they live from day to day. Lord, we would ask your blessing over them, over the teachers, guide the teachers who work with them, guide those who are working with them in the hour this morning. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Now the children are dismissed. Good morning, everybody. I'm Kate, for those of you who don't know me. I'm here to just read a passage this morning. Gosh, I said just, but it's never just with the Bible, right? This is like the real deal. So I'm going to read a passage. Um, It's Psalm 23. I feel like we all might know this one a little bit. Um, Psalm 23 is Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This morning we have the unique privilege of having Brian Cousy with us today uh, to share what God has put on his heart. So let's have a word of prayer before we start. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you provided someone to share your word, to help us understand better, to learn more about you, and more about this, the good shepherd and how you affect our lives. Bless Brian. Speak through him. May we hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Brian's going to be, come on up, Brian. Uh, You all should know Brian if you don't take a good look. Part of his family here, I think they ought to know him too. And uh, Brian, thank you for coming, and we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, Well, last month when I was up here, I made a claim that I said I love the Bible, and then I talked for 30 minutes about world events that aren't even found in the Bible. Um, I guess that, you know, that irony wasn't lost on some of you. But... um, I want to talk more about the Bible today. Instead of a, a wide sweep of history, I'm going to narrow in on just, on just one story, and it's that of the Good Shepherd, which is found throughout the Bible. And if you want to nerd out later some of the key verses that talk about the Good Shepherd are up on screen. Uh, first, let's, let's do a quick prayer here, please. Lord, thank you for bringing us together today. You are the great provider and our only hope. Be with us now and guide our hearts closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Before I start here, are there any current or former shepherds in the audience? Okay, good. Uh, And just to cover my bases, are there any sheep in the audience today? Okay, bummer, my three-year-old son will be a little disappointed. Um, Well, if you uh, know my story, you know that I didn't grow up in church. And so when I started going to church as an adult, I was a bit confused by all these references to sheep and shepherds. There's literally hundreds and hundreds of verses that talk about sheep, shepherds, lambs, rams, flocks, sheepfolds. And these weren't just references on the periphery. These were central to the story. For example, you had uh, the blood of a lamb, a young sheep, which was used to save the Jewish people in the Passover. In the story of Abraham and Isaac, Uh, God provided a ram, which is a male sheep, as the sacrifice instead of Isaac. uh, Later on in the New Testament, when uh, John the Baptist sees Jesus, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. uh, After Jesus is resurrected, he has that interchange with Peter. And three times he asks Peter, Do you love me? And Peter says, Yes. And three times Jesus gives some version of, 
feed my sheep. And then in Revelation 5, one of my all-time favorite chapters in the Bible, we're given a glimpse of the throne room of God, and Jesus is there, and he's portrayed as a lamb, but a lamb that appears slain. But yet he's the only one that has the authority to open the scroll. And for that, he's given glory and power and honor and blessing forever and ever. Well, as I read the Bible for the first time, this job of the shepherd is a recurring uh, thing that I noticed. So you've got both Moses and David were shepherds. Uh, Rachel was a shepherdess. In Moses' case, he was literally herding sheep when he had that encounter with God in the burning bush. Essentially, God said, hey, stop herding sheep and instead herd my people out of Egypt. And then once he did that, God acted like a shepherd by essentially leading the people through the wilderness as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. In David's case, he was the shepherd boy who defended his flock against a bear and a lion. And then when he takes a midday break from shepherding to go give his older brothers some lunch at the front lines of the, of the war, he ends up defending the flock of Israel against Goliath. Well, uh, where, where am I? I'll wait for it. Oh, another reference to shepherds. So in the New Testament, the shepherds in the field, they're the first to hear about baby Jesus being born. And then later, as an adult, Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. Now, it's remarkable at all that the Lord would call himself a shepherd. In ancient Israel, as in other ancient societies, being a shepherd was like the lowest of the low. It was the, the unpleasant assignment you gave to the youngest kid, like David or Rachel. But here we are, God stoops down to our level. He wants to be known as our shepherd, the one who tends to his sheep, who teaches them, who guides them, who protects them. Now, since I didn't grow up in the church or on a farm, I didn't understand these references to sheep or of people being like sheep. For example, if someone were to call me a sheep, I wouldn't have known that to be an insult versus being called, I don't know, like a moose or a llama or some other obscure uh, land animal. But apparently, sheep are some of the dumbest and most helpless of creatures. I guess this is why you don't have any team mascot that's like a sheep or a lamb. Although, although you do have the, the Los Angeles Rams. And um, maybe that explains something. Sorry. Okay, now don't raise your hands during this part, but just see if you can relate to some of these characteristics of sheep. They're restless, restless creatures. They're always searching for food to eat. But they're sort of OCD. They'll keep going back to the same spots over and over again. They, they need help to find new pasture for grazing or water to drink. They seldom lie down and only do so when their stomach is full and they are convinced of their safety. They can't really care for themselves. Depending on how big their coat gets, if they fall, they might need help getting back up. They're super timid and stressed about their surroundings. Without any natural defenses, they're easily spooked and startled. They don't have sharp teeth or claws, they can't kick, they can't swim, and they can't outrun an enemy. Now, but they're also social animals. If they get isolated from the herd, though, they could die from elevated levels of stress and anxiety. So despite this, sheep will occasionally stray from the herd, which puts their very life in danger. Now, if a shepherd has a sheep that repeatedly strays, he'll just break one of its legs and then put it on his shoulders until it heals, and that, that sheep's not going to stray again. They won't drink water, moving water, if it, even if it's shallow. So because they have these big wool coats, running water poses a serious threat to them. They could get swept away and drown. You could have a sheep die of thirst right next to water if that water is moving or rippling. They're by nature followers, which means they aren't very attentive to their surroundings. And like me, they have a terrible sense of direction. If a sheep at the front of the flock falls off a cliff, there's a good chance that the rest of them could fall too. So this, this is what the, the animal that the Bible says that we're like. So we're also restless beings, are we not? Constantly worrying, prone to stray. And unless our hearts are free from fear and anxiety, we too seldom find rest. So regardless, the illustration of a shepherd and a sheep must be very important to God because the Bible is filled with these references. God clearly wants to show his nature as the shepherd and our position as the sheep. And while we can, unfortunately, identify with the sheep, the story isn't primarily about us. 
It's about the shepherd. The shepherd is the hero of the story. The sheep's only security is the shepherd. So let me try to make that point by taking the example of a sheep who somehow survived on its own for several years. It happened in New Zealand in 2004, and he apparently avoided being caught by hiding in caves for six years, so they named him Shrek. Here's what Shrek looked like when he was finally caught. Or not. Let's try that again. It was working. Maybe I'll just have to ask you to move the slide. Okay. It's hilarious. Trust me. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll keep going. Just picture a lamb with a lot of wool. Uh, a lot of wool. Um, so this poor guy had 60 pounds of wool on him. That's uh, six times the normal amount. That's enough to make 20 men's suits. <laughs> All right. That's him after he got caught. Now. This guy became a celebrity in New Zealand. He got to meet the prime minister. He was sheared uh, live on national television. They auctioned off his wool to raise money for charity. And thankfully, this guy got caught because not only can a sheep's uh, coat get all matted, uh, but dirt and droppings can get embedded in the fur, and he can get infections and, and whatnot. And as you can imagine, with a coat this big, how do you, how do you regulate your temperature? And so falling could definitely be fatal for this guy. Now, all of this makes a lot of sense to me because our family pet is Brody the Bernadoodle. Okay, that's working now. Now, he's part poodle and part Bernese mountain dog, which means he has the hypoallergenic hair of a poodle. So that means you've got to cut his hair about every three or four months. And if you don't, he's a hot mess. You know, this is the before and after picture of a, fo of a haircut, a recent haircut. Now, he's a hot mess when he's, he's constantly panting because he's overheating. He um, gets, his hair gets all matted, which is really painful for him. If we take him for a walk in the park, he's somehow collected every species of prickly plant life, and it's embedded into his fur, and it's really painful to get out. I mean, he's supposed to be part mountain dog, but uh, five minutes of playing in the snow, he's embedded like all of these snowballs into his paw and all the way up his, his legs, so that you can't just like bonk them off, because if you pull them, they'll, he'll yelp in pain because it's like pulling his hair. So we literally have to take our mountain dog and put him in a bath of water in order to melt the snowballs off. I mean, if we lived in warmer or in a snowier climate, we'd have to get special shoes for him. I mean, he's high maintenance, kind of like a sheep. So this is Shrek a little bit more puffed up. He got cleaned up a little bit for national television. Now, I think Shrek fared better on his own than Brody would have. Um, but essentially, Shrek was weighed down by things he was never meant to bear. He needed the loving attention of a good shepherd. So when I look at this picture, I'm reminded of John Bunyan's classic, The Pilgrim's Progress, where the main character, Christian, starts off his spiritual journey just carrying this unbearable burden of his, of his guilt, his brokenness, and the shame that he can never satisfy a, a moral standard, even close to it. Well, when Shrek was finally sheared, he shed those burdens. Now, is this not a picture of what it looks like to be born again? Well, that's just a little bit of background on sheep and shepherds, and hopefully that will help bring the parable of the Good Shepherd to life. Now, what image comes to mind for you when you think about the Good Shepherd? It's probably something like this. I saw this in a friend's house once in his hallway, and I had no idea why Jesus was carrying a sheep, an animal on his uh, shoulders. Why can't the sheep walk? Is this like an ancient way to do like a weighted squat or lunge or something? Um, well, a few years ago, Carly and I went to Rome, and I somehow twisted her arm into going to seeing the underground cemetery called the catacombs. So the Good Shepherd image that comes to mind for me is something like this. Now, the catacombs were primarily in the second and third centuries, and they contain the earliest of Christian art. There's three images in particular that were the oldest. The fish symbol, which you guys have all would know. The vine, and Russ preached on that last week, actually, and the good shepherd. So these were the simple pictures painted on cave walls under the light of torches and candles that represented the idea of Christ as Savior to the earliest Christians. 
So the parable of the good shepherd is quite well known. It's referred to in all four Gospels and in 1 Peter. Now, one thing I want to show you today is that this story has had a thousand-year journey through the Bible. It starts primarily with David's Psalm 23, and although even in Genesis, God is referred to as a shepherd, it's then retold by three Old Testament prophets, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Zechariah, and then it's retold and referenced again in the New Testament by Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Peter. And at each point of its evolution, God reveals more about himself and his salvation plan. So let's start our journey in Psalm 23. Here's the first four verses, and this was read earlier. This is the most famous of the Psalms. If you grew up in a Christian household, there's a good chance you've got a painting, a pillow, or something embroidered with the quotes from this Psalm. Millions of people have memorized these verses. For some people, it would be the last words they would ever speak or hear. Now, David is the author of this Psalm. As a boy, he was a shepherd over his father's flock, and as a man, he was made shepherd over the people of Israel as their king. But in this psalm, he's not the shepherd. He is part of the flock. But this is God's flock, and David describes in fewer words than this, but how the shepherd cares about him, how he knows him, how he understands him, how he watches over him, how he guides him, how he's gentle with him, how he nourishes him, comforts him, fights for him, and stays near him. In verse 1, it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, the word want is a bit confusing here, and it's not the greatest translation in modern English, um, because it gives you the impression if God is your shepherd, he'll give you whatever you want. Um, but it doesn't mean desire, it actually means lack. So David is saying, we will lack nothing as God's sheep. Now, this psalm is just masterful poetry, but it's not all rosy. There, like any good story, there's a sense of danger lurking about, and we hit that discordant note in verse 4 with the valley of the shadow of death. Now, before I was a Christian, I honestly thought that was a line written by the rapper Coolio for the Dangerous Minds soundtrack, a few of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> when I heard that line from Coolio, I was thinking, dang, Coolio's deep. <laughs> uh, I guess there's nothing new under the sun. So the valley of the shadow of death um, that's such an interesting and powerful phrase. In a valley, you're, you're hedged in, you're surrounded. It's like a section of the path, though, in this psalm that, that cannot be avoided either. Now, there's clearly a threat of death, but it's more of a fear of death, potentially not death itself, because it's referred to as a shadow. Now, death is the one certainty of life, is it not? We live under the constant shadow of death every day. But a shadow isn't tangible. You need light to cause a shadow and something tangible to block it. So perhaps David isn't in total darkness here. But clearly, evil, fear, and death are all around. But thankfully, David is not alone. The shepherd is with him. He's leading him. The shepherd has the rod and the staff. Now, the rod is like a weapon against wild animals and thieves. It's short, about this long, and it looks like a mace. And he's... And uh, he's also got the uh, staff, which is much longer, and it's got a crook at the end. It was used to bring in wayward sheep back into the fold. Now, essentially, the rod is a symbol of authority and protection, and the staff was a symbol of care. And both of these items would have been comforting to the flock. Now, did you know that another word for shepherd is pastor? Now, Pastor John is our local shepherd. And even though there's no mention of a sabbatical for shepherds, I'll have to have a word with John when he gets back. Um, it's a well-needed break because a pastor is tasked with walking with lots of people through the valley. I'm not sure what you would do to prepare a person to walk with a congregation of people through loss over a long period of time. But despite the hurt and the pain and the emotional baggage that every pastor must carry, John is, and we are, people of hope. Notice that the valley is not the destination. They walk through the valley. It's subtle, but I don't want you to miss this point. Oh, of course, I just lost my place. <laughs> I wanted this to point that, that, this, that uh, you get through the valley, that this is not your, your home. Um, well, I totally lost my place. Um, oh, there's also no bypass or magical escape either. As the popular child song goes, you can't, we can't go over it, we can't go under it, we have to go through it. Right? Anyone know that? Uh, some people, okay. Because uh, we live on the other side of the resurrection, we can't help but look at the valley through a New Testament lens and think, of course, the only way to conquer death is through the promise of resurrection. 
Now, evil and death are real and must be faced, but death doesn't have the final say. Death can't hold you. With Jesus as our good shepherd and the one that's by our side, he's the one who conquered death. We only face the shadow of death. Heaven is our real home. In other words, only Jesus can deliver us from our fear of death. Okay, here's the full psalm now. So David lived a thousand years before Jesus, but he sure drops a lot of hints about Jesus. Notice how the valley is where God walks on stage. God moves from the third person, the Lord and he, in verses 1 through 3, to the second person, you, in verse 4. Now, I think to us Christians, this is a clear sign of the incarnation in which God enters history. Now, God is not aloof and distant. One of the primary themes throughout the Bible is that God is with us. He was with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He's with David in the Valley of the Shadow of Death. Jesus was known as Emmanuel, which means God with us. The Holy Spirit was granted to us in us. And there is the future promise to be with Jesus forever in the new heavens and the new earth. Now, in the psalm, we have God walking on stage in verse 4 and the glorious ending in verse 6. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There is no doubt about our future. Oh, sorry, that's the end of the quote. So, there is no doubt about our future. No uncertainty or insecurity. We have a secure destiny with God. Now, one final observation before we leave Psalm 23, and it's rather subtle, but in verse 3, when David says, he restores my soul and leads me on paths of righteous, righteousness, we're left to assume that David strayed, was lost, and needed saving and correction. And this won't be a surprise based on what we know of David's life. And regardless, the shepherd who restores the lost sheep is a theme that will be more pronounced in later retellings of the story. Okay, let's fast forward in time. Several hundred years have elapsed since David wrote those famous lines. We have three Old Testament prophets that are going to enter the picture and retell the story. It's Jeremiah, pictured here, Ezekiel, and Zechariah. Now, we don't have time to go into each version, but there's a similar theme of lost sheep and a shepherd who seeks and saves the lost. But each retelling also introduces new aspects of the story. All three Old Testament prophets introduce bad shepherds to the story. Now, these are bad leaders who scatter the sheep. Now, as a reminder, Jeremiah would have been writing during the time of the war with Babylon, in which his country was defeated, the temple was completely destroyed, and nearly all able, able bodies were taken off as slaves. And despite being in the midst of total destruction of their entire way of life, Jeremiah gives the people hope that all things will be well. And he contrasts the bad shepherds with a promise that God will provide a good shepherd. And he gives a clue to the lineage of the good shepherd, that he will be a righteous branch from the line of David, who will be wise, just, and righteous. Now, Ezekiel also says the good shepherd will be a descendant of David. Now, later on, the prophet Micah also chimes in here. He says, he's even more explicit. He says that the Messiah will be from ancient days, but coming from Bethlehem, who will be great to the ends of the earth, and he will shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. Okay, let's draw a bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the good shepherd was God, or Yahweh, who would one day enter history, make up for the failures of the bad shepherds, and restore the flock. In the New Testament, Jesus is clearly talking about himself as the good shepherd. Essentially, Jesus writes himself into the story as the God character, as the central actor, the hero. He's affirming that he's the living affirmation of, the in, of that incarnation, of the ancient promise, excuse me. Now, the Gospels are littered with stories about Jesus engaged in finding and restoring the lost sheep. Even in the final minutes of Jesus' life, Jesus turns to the repentant criminal next to him and says, join me in paradise. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus says things like, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Now, this is finding and it's restoring, and you can think of it as a search and rescue mission. The searching and the rescuing are the related tasks, but they're separate activities. Now, theologically, this is incarnation, where the, God, the good shepherd takes action to seek, to find, to gather. And theologically, it's atonement, to save and to restore. 
Now, our response as sheep is repentance and then acceptance of the gift of salvation. Okay, those can be heady concepts. So to bring this to life, Jesus uses the word pictures of the famous Good Shepherd story. So when a sheep strays from the herd and realizes it's lost, it'll hide in the bushes or a rock, and then it will bleat out for help. Now, figuratively speaking, the lost sheep is in the valley of the shadow of death right now. Now, this can be a crippling fear, but the sheep must expend every ounce of energy bleeding out for help. The cry is basically saying, I can't find my way home. My only hope is to be rescued by the good shepherd. Now, if you're someone who thinks in terms of pictures, then a lost sheep who cries out for help is what repentance looks like. The shepherd must locate the sheep quickly before any predators do. As the shepherd searches, he'll use his own unique call. If the sheep recognizes that call, it'll bleat back as if the two are talking to each other, and that helps the shepherd locate the sheep. The sheep must accept being found. Running away will do it no good. When it's finally found, it's not uncommon for the sheep to be so traumatized that it can't walk back, and so the shepherd must put it on its shoulder and carry it back to the flock. So in Luke's retelling of the story, he focuses on a costly demonstration of love in order to restore the lost sheep. So here's the gist of the story. The shepherd leaves the 99 in the wilderness to go after the one. Now, this passage has always troubled me because I manage risk for a living. Billions of dollars are entrusted to me and my team all from institutions all around the world, and our main job is to reduce unwanted risk. And so... Uh, as part of my day job, I'm just sort of obsessed with reducing risk. And so here we are. We have the shepherd leaving the 99 sheep in the wilderness to go after one. We're left wondering, did this shepherd have some help? Did he enclose the sheep in, in some kind of enclosure or a cave? Did he at least have a sheep dog? We don't know. But, from his, but here's one thing we do know. The shepherd is willing to endure risk to go after the lost sheep. From his perspective, the flock is not complete with that one missing sheep. Now, I think this speaks to God's amazing, even reckless love. Of course, I'm still troubled by the situation. Was the shepherd irresponsible for risking the safety of the 99 to seek after the one? My human brain says yes, but that speaks to my many limitations. And while you are, or I may be burdened by this dilemma, the good shepherd is not. By going after the one, he gives the rest of the flock an incredible sense of security. The flock is reassured that if they too would get lost, that the good shepherd would come after them. So alternatively, if the shepherd does not go after the one, then the 99 will live in constant fear of getting lost too, because if they do, they're as good as dead. And if salvation is up to the action of the sheep, then we've arrived at the dead end of a works-based faith. But the story of the good shepherd is not at all about the resilience of the sheep. It's about the unmerited, costly love of the good shepherd. The gospel isn't an invitation for us as sheep to work harder it's an invitation for us to rest harder in who God is and what he's done. And keep in mind that the 99 are still in the wilderness. They still need the good shepherd to get home. I think if the, 90, oh, if the 99 think they can manage on their own or that they know better than the shepherd, then they're really no different than the older son in the parable of the prodigal son, which Luke tells next. They're still completely dependent on the good shepherd to bring them out of the wilderness. Their rescue looks different, but involves those same elements. Okay, now we come to perhaps people's most favorite version of the Good Shepherd parable, and it's in the story of, uh, it's in the Gospel of John. And here's where we get Jesus' most clear teaching about the true meaning behind the story. So for a thousand years, God was the Good Shepherd in the story, but all throughout the New Testament, Jesus puts a face to who the Good Shepherd is. He writes himself into the parable. Now this is presumed in other passages, but in John, Jesus says it uh, boldly and clearly. I am the Good Shepherd. He says it multiple times. This is also the passage where Jesus calls himself the door. And to explain this, here's a picture of a sheep pen. It's a roofless structure made of stones and to keep the sheep in and the wolves out. And these pens are scattered throughout the countryside as shepherds move from place to place, seeking grazing lands far from home. And with no door, the only vulnerable spot is the entrance. And this is where the shepherd will sleep. So the shepherd literally becomes the door. So consider this picture as you listen to what Jesus says in John 10. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And again, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved 
and will go in and out and find pasture. And just like Psalm 23, in John's version of the story, there's a sense of real danger. So in previous texts, the flock is scattered and lost. In John, the flock is in danger from thieves and robbers. Here we also see how the cost of the good shepherd has greatly intensified. So in prior retellings of the story, the cost of the shepherd was a dangerous journey through the night to go find the lost sheep, and then carrying that lost sheep probably back on its shoulders. But in John's retelling, the stakes have escalated. The cost uh, is the very life of the shepherd in a battle with the wolf. The act of saving the sheep involved laying down his life as the shepherd. But that's not the end, and there's no sense of hopelessness in John's version. In John, the ending is expanded to include a vision of the end of all things where there is one flock and one shepherd. When the Lord is our shepherd, we follow the one who knows the very best destination, and he can get us there. He not only knows the way, he is the way, he is the door. He is leading us to an eternal dwelling, a place that he's prepared especially for us. Well, to most of us, the job of shepherding is completely foreign, <laughs> and yet when told well, a simple story of a lost sheep and a loving shepherd can bring us to tears. We, we see ourselves as the helpless sheep lost in the wilderness, crying out for help. The good shepherd seeks the lost by entering the wilderness as incarnation and pays a high price, in our case, the ultimate price, to get the sheep back. That's atonement. And when this happens, the Bible tells us there is restoration and also joy and celebration in heaven. Well, this sermon's been about analyzing the progression of a single story over a thousand years, so let me close with a story. So during some riots in Palestine in the 1930s, the British government came in and confiscated all the livestock, including all the sheep. Now, among the villagers there um, was a, an eight-year-old boy, excuse me, he was a boy, and he was an orphan boy, and he could get his sheep back by paying a price. So somehow he gets, raises enough funds to get his eight sheep back. And then he goes to the officer and hands him his money. And the officer counts it and says, okay, you can go get your eight sheep back. And the boy says, no, I, I, want, I want my eight sheep back. And the British officer scoffs at the idea that he can be, pick out eight particular sheep amongst this vast population. Well, the shepherd boy knows better. He lets out his own unique call. And sure enough, eight sheep separate from the population, and follow the boy home. Well, what about you? Will you be able to hear and respond to the good shepherd's call? I mean, we're not yet home. In some cases, we're still in the, the dangerous wilderness. There's an evil one who wants to still steal, kill, and destroy. Sin is crouching at the door. He desires to have you. There are false shepherds calling your name. Our only hope is in the good shepherd. The question at the end is not whether Jesus is the good shepherd. The Bible has made that abundantly clear. The question at the end is whether Jesus is your good shepherd. Will you have ears to hear his call and follow him home? If you're not sure, please come talk to one of the elders here, and we can put you in touch with our local shepherd, Pastor John. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, no matter how dark the valley or how scary the wilderness, let us rest knowing that you are with us, that you never cease pursuing us. Shear off all our anxieties and burdens. Our only hope is in you, Jesus. Amen.
It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. You give life. your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Great. I need you 
I want to read you a couple of verses from the book of Jude, which is one we don't read from with frequency. But to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. Have a marvelous week. May God walk with you and you walk with him. Thank you.